Now our closer look at a political shocker, a rising Republican star's stunning primary loss to a long shot Tea Party candidate. Eric Cantor is here for his first network interview since the votes were counted. But before we get to that, ABC's Jeff Zeleny on all the fallout. A stunning upset in the Virginia Republican primary race. It's not a joke at all. It looks like he has pulled off the upset of the political year. It stunned just about everyone, including the man in the middle of it all. I know there's a lot of long faces here tonight, and um, it's disappointing, sure. So how did Eric Cantor, who was at the table for nearly every big moment in Washington, lose his primary? Perhaps it's a mix of three reasons. First, did he lose touch with his district? That's what these voters said. He's up there, he's a Washington boy. He wasn't for our district. I haven't seen Cantor any place. He just, he's too, he's too good to come around and see everybody. Or did he get caught off guard by a fresh face riding a Tea Party talk radio wave? Oh, thank you for coming out. Dave Bratt is an economics professor whose anti-Washington message caught fire. Overnight, he became a Republican giant slayer with a shoestring operation compared to Cantor's gold-plated campaign. While Cantor once spent $18,000 for lodging and catering at the Beverly Hills Hotel, Bratt's largest similar expense was a $789 check to Honey Baked Ham. When we met Bratt last month, he pulled up outside the Capitol in his Chevy. I tell the truth and I, I will be the voice of the people and I will be accessible. Or was Cantor's shocking loss really about immigration? Cantor said it was time to find common ground, but Bratt took a hard line. Stop amnesty by stopping Eric Cantor on election day. Cantor's defeat makes Republicans even more skittish about embracing immigration reform. In terms of dealing with issues like immigration, if Eric Cantor can be branded, uh, you know, that he is uh, supporting amnesty, how can your party ever move forward on an issue like this? We don't know that that is the issue or was the issue in the election. Republicans will choose a new majority leader this week. Another chapter in the Tea Party clash with the GOP establishment that raises new questions about whether there's room for compromise under that big Republican tent. I think that this town should be about trying to strike common ground. For this week, Jeff Zeleny, ABC News, Capitol Hill. All right, Eric Cantor joins us right now. So uh, let me ask you, your, your friend Vin Weber said this was an earthquake that nobody thought you would lose. And, and watching you on election night, you certainly looked stunned. Did this completely shock you? Uh, absolutely, Jonathan. I, I don't think anybody in the country thought that the outcome would be what it was. And, um, you know, I, I just am a believer, uh, as I said that night and subsequently, that, you know, there are some things that happen for a reason, and we may not be able to really discern it now. And given the perspective of, of time, I think we're going to be able to look back at this and what seemed really bad uh, at the time may turn out to be really good. Your pollster, John McLaughlin, had you up 34 points. You paid him, what, $75,000? Are you expecting a refund? I mean, <laughs> what, what happened there? <laughs> now, listen, I, I know there's going to be a lot of people and a lot of polls being done to sort of dissect what happened. Uh, and, you know, frankly, that's really not uh, what I am focused on now. And, in fact, I want to take uh, what I've been doing here and uh, the experience and privilege I've had of representing the people of the 7th District of Virginia and be able to, to really look towards the future so I can really continue to promote and be a champion for the conservative cause. Well, I want to get to what you're going to do, but you said the day after the election that you did everything you could. You, you really believe that? And you we, lost by double digits. We ran a campaign uh, premised on conservative solutions that help working middle class families in the 7th District of Virginia. It's very much the same that we're trying to do here in Washington. You know, people are hurting right now. You know, you're saying that I certainly have had a personal setback, but that problem pales in the comparison of the problem that really working middle class Americans are having every day. Some are out of a job. Some can't make ends meet. We've got to be focused on how we, as conservatives, can help people that are suffering under this economy, under Obama's policies. But this, this was a staggering turn of events uh, for you. Uh, you know, you had been considered the next speaker of the House. Uh, you saw that in the headlines, Eric Cantor, the next speaker. Had you done anything, had you talked to anybody to prepare for a possible run against John Boehner for speaker? No, I, listen, I was... Nothing? You hadn't talked about this? No, I, you know, Jonathan, 
Um, I have been really privileged to be the representative of the 7th District of Virginia for almost 14 years. I was also given the privilege of serving as majority leader by my colleagues. My focus of, of my team, myself, every day was uh, to shape an agenda to continue to put ideas out there that reflect our common sense conservative solutions. We, we're we're going to have um, a moment in this country where we need actually to solve problems and stop, you know, the kind of lurch leftward that we're seeing. And so I believe we're getting ready for that. Uh, and as I go forward, I will continue to find ways that I can be influential in making sure that we continue that drive for solutions. So there's been a lot of discussion as to what happened, why you lost. Uh, one of your uh, colleagues, Republican colleagues in the House, Steve King, had this to say uh, in a tweet to election night. Earth shaking primary results in Virginia tonight, resounding rejection of amnesty and support for rule of law, personal regrets to Eric. So is that what this was? Was this an earth shaking a result, a rejection of amnesty, of, okay. of immigration reform? First of all, I don't think there's any one particular reason why the outcome was what it was. And there, you know, if you think about it, there are a number of things that go through voters' minds when they go into the voting booth. But as far as immigration is concerned, my position never wavered. I have always taken the position that I'm not for a comprehensive amnesty bill. I've always said that we ought to deal with the kids who did not break any laws of their and themselves came into this country in many cases unbeknownst to them. I've always said that. And it's a principled position. And it's one I think that offers the only plausible way forward. Now, did that infuriate folks on both sides? Sure. I said, but it is the principled position. I think a st a, an incremental reform approach to immigration is what we need. We got to focus on the things we agree on, not that which we don't. I've told the president this, my colleagues are well aware of it, and I think my constituents were. Laura Ingram was among those who went after you, and she went after you in, in a deeply personal ways. Uh, I want to play some of her, it seemed like a little bit of gloating after the election. Here's what she had to say. He wasn't coming clean on what his real views on immigration were, uh, and I think people, I think people understood that in the end. And well, they saw what, phony, Laura? and he came across as a phony. I mean, I'm sorry, but he came across very two-faced on that issue. So, I mean, she, she even said that, suggested you should be traded to the Taliban, uh, you know, uh, somewhat of a joke. Did, did she cross the line? Do you blame her for, for the loss here? Listen, I, I'm not into blaming anybody, uh, but I would say that that uh, suggestion that I should have been traded to the Taliban for Sergeant Bergdahl um, really is not a serious contribution to any public policy debate. And frankly, I don't think that it reflects on the people uh, who self-identify as Tea Partiers. Um, I think they reject that kind of notion uh, and it's just not serious and frankly it cheapens the debate. Well what do you say to those Tea Party, those groups claiming they represent the Tea Party, going after you, going after other uh, uh, Republican leaders? What well, kind of listen, contribution are those groups making? Listen, there's a lot of frustration out there. I've seen it. There's frustration against this president. There's a frustration against Washington of not being able to stop this president when he says, I've got a phone and a pen and I'm going to do what I want if you Republicans don't agree with me. There is frustration. And one of the things that, you know, I, you know, I've got, I, I want to remember is Tea Party means taxed enough already. You know, these are moms and dads, grandmothers and grandfathers that got into the political debate and process back in 2009 after the lurch leftward expansion of government with Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, cap-and-trade, stimulus, and the rest. So, so was your defeat of a victory for the Tea Party, as people have portrayed it? Listen, I, I think that what we need to focus on, and I'm hopeful that I'll be able to do something about bridging this divide. There is a divide uh, within our party. And again, I hope that it is the way towards divide, uh, bridging that divide is through solutions. You know, we've got to demonstrate that conservative ideas through limited government, personal responsibility, creating more space in the private sector is the answer to so many working middle class people's problems right now. Okay, so what is next for you? Do you see yourself ever running for office again? 
You know, Jonathan, I'm going to uh, be talking to my wife a lot, and it's, uh, you know, we, we have uh, had a wonderful relationship and married for almost 25 years, and she and I are going to make some decisions together about how we go forward. Um, I don't want to close off any options right now. I'm just hopeful that I can continue to be a champion for the kinds of things that we are working on here in Washington. Um, I believe after almost 23 years in public service, 23 plus years in public service, that, that I can play play a role, um, and not just in elected office, obviously, but in the private sector. Would you rule out becoming a lobbyist? Um, I, don't, I'm, I, I don't think that I want to be a lobbyist, but I do want to be, uh, play a role uh, in, in the public debate. Um, I've had a lot of experience, obviously, in the intersection of government, politics, um, issues affecting uh, the global economy. Uh, so again, I've been very gratified by the number of people that have reached out to me already. But I think these are decisions right. that my wife and I will make as I continue to want to serve out my term. All right, Eric Cantor, thank you very much for joining us.